have you ever looked up at the stars and wondered, would it be possible to live up there? And if so, would it be that different from how life is here on Earth? I grew up in a small town in the north of Spain. And when I was a little kid, I didn't have any tall buildings around me. So every night, I used to look at the sky and ask myself these questions. 40 years later, as an architect and as a member of the Technical Committee for Space Architecture of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, I think I know the answer. But the question is why? Why do we even want to consider creating human settlements of world? From my expertise in the design field, I can say that it's quite hard to innovate by trying to give different solutions to the same question. But if we change the question, we can automatically come up with different answers, which means we will be able to get ideas that we might not have thought of otherwise. I believe if we are able to provide a sustainable settlement in extreme environments like those on Mars, we can have insights to apply on Earth to solve many of the challenges that we will face in the next 50 years associated with population growth climate change, and social inequality. So, let's travel to Mars and understand why settlements on the red planet might look apparently very different to ours on Earth. The red planet is a very, very harsh environment. But at the same time, it offers opportunities for permanent settlements, especially because of the access to resources like minerals, water, and sun gravity, which is one third of what we have here on Earth. This is the dream job of an architect. Imagine, you can now build big spaces on Mars because you don't have to be concerned about the gravity. Not really. We cannot really build big spaces on Mars. But it's not because of gravity. It's because of pressure. The air that humans will need inside of the buildings will be at 100 times more pressure than the outside atmosphere. That means that the buildings could easily explode, very similar to how a balloon will explode if you inflate it too much. So I guess no big spaces on Mars. But we have more challenges. The main one is radiation. Anyone exposed for long periods to the sky would develop cancer due to solar and gamma radiation. So we need to protect our buildings with materials that absorb and protect us from this lethal problem. One of the solutions is to build 3D printed structures or geodesic domes on the surface of Mars and then have large canopies protecting those buildings from their radiation or from potential impact from micrometeorites. This is an interesting solution. But it's not very scalable, because it would require a lot of materials to build those structures. However, we have other technical solutions to achieve large-scale settlements on Mars. One of them is creating tunnels inside cliffs. The advantage of a cliff is that the rock protects us from radiation and effectively absorbs the pressure from the inside spaces. But the solution has more advantages. For example, on Mars, even in the warmer areas, temperatures can drop as low as minus 100 degrees Celsius. However, by being inside the rock, we are able to protect and maintain the temperature more efficiently. Additionally, a clip allows a very compact urban solution because it can create a three-dimensional web of tunnels. Finally, we are able to bring indirect light in from the wall of the cliff, which is essential for the well-being of humans. If we imagine the living areas on Mars, they will probably be very similar to co-living environments on Earth, where we have a small private apartments and then we have larger communal areas to socialize and expand on our day-to-day -day activities. This strategy allows us to reduce the total built area which is very important on Mars, because building and maintaining spaces require many resources. We propose a small individual apartments, each 25 square meters per person. These apartments are modular and can be recombined 
to create bigger apartments to accommodate to the specific members of a family. To ensure scalability, the apartments are pre-manufactured locally on Mars with steel, which is not too difficult to obtain with chemical combinations of iron, CO2, and water. We propose parks that act as buffer zones between the outside of Mars and the inner spaces. These gardens act as a bridge between the past and the future because we want to bring seeds from Earth to grow the plants. These environments also create a strong sense of identity because they will allow a direct visual relationship with the Martian horizons. Identity is very important because a sense of belonging is what will make citizens proud of where they live. But the development of identity through self-expression will also be reflected in arts and even in fashion, which we think will be very different from Earth, considering that we have less gravity. So we can use weights as accessories to help the newcomers adapt to the Red Planet. The scientific community still does not have enough information to understand the long-term implications of low-gravity environments on the body. But one thing that we know is that we will have to exercise a lot. So we are proposing working pods that combine work and exercise at the same time. It's cool, right? On Mars, we will have to rely on artificial intelligence and robotics, but humans will have to control them. Those robotics will operate other important life support systems, like power generation, which we envision mainly through solar energy. However, on Mars, we have long-lasting dust storms that negate access to the sunlight. So we will need a backup during those periods. Unfortunately, geothermal energy does not seem to be an option on Mars. So we are proposing nuclear energy as that backup. Artificial intelligence will also control the farming areas, which will consist of hydroponics, aquaponics, and microalgae cultivations, which are technologies that are extremely efficient regarding the use of space. Which connects to the question, what are we going to eat on Mars? Well, there is a lot of debate about that, but one thing is clear, having large animals on Mars is very costly due to the food they eat, the space they need, and the energy that they require to stay alive, it's not efficient to use animals in our diet. We will have animals on Mars, but will probably be only for psychological purposes. That means that the diet should be mainly vegetarian, in combination with some insects. Tasty, right? I know, I'm sure I lost many of you with this idea of eating insects, but Hey, that's fine. There is not really a lot of space to accommodate us all in Mars. Just a few million people might be able to live in the entire Red Planet. As a result, Mars can never be considered a plan B for Earth. So remember, we need to take care of Earth. Mars is just the first step for humans becoming multiplanetary species. On Mars, we are able to provide all the space required for farming in 100 square meters per person. However, if we look on Earth, we consume 6,000 square meters of land for agriculture and livestock. That is 60 times more. This surprising difference gives us an opportunity to reduce the amount of space we use on Earth for food generation by implementing new technologies and changing our diet. Those three areas could be, for example, used for reforestation, which will help with global warming. Additionally, on Mars, thanks to a group-oriented lifestyle, we are able to save a lot of space, solving all private and common areas in a total of 130 square meters per person, which is similar to the density of environments like Manhattan or Hong Kong Island. As an architect, I like to think that the built environment plays a critical role in the way we live. But how do we design a settlement in a location we have never been before? Indeed, do we actually want to plan something like this? From my knowledge in urban planning and history of architecture, I have found 
that the most exciting cities are those that combine planning with organic growth, where the communities are the ones that build the cities, not the urban planners. But on Mars, we still don't have Martians. So how can we provide opportunity for people to determine their physical environment? For two years, my team and I have been working with multidisciplinary experts and scientists with the vision to create a real-time digital version of a self-sufficient settlement on Mars. This digital twin can be experienced through virtual reality with the objective of acting as a platform for anyone to join and shape the future of how we will live on Mars. But digital replicas of urban settlements are also great opportunities even on Earth, as big data and immersive experiences allow citizens to become truly active creators and decision makers of the physical environments where we live. In the case of Mars, a digital environment can recreate future ecosystems, so the community provides the feedback today, and as a result, the digital twin continues to adapt and improve until we are ready to actually execute it on Mars, hopefully in the next few decades. But this reciprocal feedback between the digital twin and its virtual citizens can also be applied to other areas beyond the physical environment. For example, how will be the economics or political models on Mars? How will we adapt social relationships and laws to a new reality? Well, the truth is that we don't know, and that is where the community plays a critical role. We even see an opportunity to create A-B testing, where City A and City B have the same exact physical characteristics, but they have different political and economical models to test, validate, and learn from. Space architects can design a preliminary canvas for future settlements. But the Martian cities need to adapt to its inhabitants. And therefore, we will need to rely on an active collaboration from society. As a result, those cities will evolve in an organic manner. It is exciting to realize how technology can allow us to travel through space and time. As I mentioned before, when I was a kid, I often look up at the sky and ask myself, would it be possible to live up there? And if so, would it be very different from here? What I didn't know at that time is that very near from where I was born, there is a UNESCO site called Atapuerca, where archaeologists have found that 1.2 million years ago, humans were very similar to how we are today. They were going inside caves to look for protection from the extreme environments. And they were nomads, not only to search for resources to survive, but also because exploration is part of who we are as humans. They were forming communities to take care of each other, and they looked for a sense of identity. They also used tools and technology to achieve all of it. In 50 years, we could be living on Mars. But the main characteristics between how that life would be and how we were living 1.2 million years ago might not be that different. In the past, our ancestors had to adapt to the environment. But nowadays, it is very easy for us to change our ecosystem to adapt it to our lifestyle. In the near future, to survive on Mars, we will have to adapt to our surroundings, which means we will be forced to change our lives to accommodate to a new reality of an extreme environment. But many parts of Earth might become harsh environments soon if we do not take a proactive action. So I would like to finish with a question for all of us. How long will we wait to fully adapt our lifestyle to the environment instead of constantly adapting our surroundings to our lifestyle. Thank you very much.